World War II. And what was your branch of service? T5 as a corporal. Okay. You were in uh, uh, the Army? Yeah. Any aircraft artillery. In, in, I'm sorry? Any aircraft artillery. Any aircraft artillery, okay. And your highest rank was E5, corporal. Right. Okay. And can you just tell me in what general locations it was that you served? Well, I was in the Ardennes Forest. The world knows of the Battle of the Bulge. That was my first battle. I never thought I'd come home from there. <laughs> the Germans had us trapped, and I thought it was all over, really. But we made it. I can say I was 23 years old. One of my buddies got killed. When, when the war ended, we shook hands with each other. We're all kids from, from, from the States. We beat the mighty German army. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You were in a second battle. What was the, what was the second battle? Second battle was the uh, uh, Remagen Bridge at the uh, Remagen Dusseldorf Bridge. Okay. Now before before we got to the bridge, our planes were trying to knock that bridge out. Right. And then we came, and it was a terrific battle there between the, uh, the Germans and us, both sides of the, the Rhine, really shooting point blank at each other. But we, we beat them. That's how we won the war. That's a, that ended the war almost. We got across the Rhine. That really ended the war. And you said you had a third battle in your part. That was that was in central Germany. That was my last battle. Okay. And we're gonna we're gonna come back and talk about each one of those. Yeah. But I want to well, central central Germany was was all over. Yeah. Not really nothing to it, but especially it, after the other two. Oh, yeah. We're going to come back and talk about those. But I kind of want to back up a little bit. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. I was not supposed to be in the Army. Can I tell you that? Well, tell us. Tell me. I'm a, I'm a foundryman. Mm -hmm. And I never knew being a foundry was the first one on the, the list of the United States not supposed to be drafted because they needed the foundrymen to make castings. And uh, I used to, when I used to get a, a notice from my draft board, I'd give it to my boss and turn it in, and I'd get deferred for six, seven months. I was, can I talk the way I like to talk? I was, yes, a, I was a stupid kid. And I figured, you know, it's all way, flag waving and band playing, but it, was, it wasn't. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be in the Army. Now I get, in, I get my next, these kind of keeping company with my wife, and we'd be walking in the streets, and people looking at me, why are you in the service? And I, I felt guilty. And when my last drafting came, I didn't give it to my boss, and that's how I got drafted. I, I was taking care of my father, he was 75 years old. My brother Jimmy was already in the army quite a few years, and I wasn't supposed to be in. I get drafted, I'm in Georgia. My oldest brother writes me a letter. What are you doing in this service? You're not supposed to be there. You're, you're a foundryman. And you left Papa all alone. Who's going to take care of him? I didn't think about that. My brothers had their, their families to take care of. I went to my captain. I said, I got to go home, Cap. I got to take care of my father. He's in the army. You can't go home. Then I'll run away. And we'll send the MPs after you, put you in jail. Fine, I'll run away from there too. We'll have to shoot you. Then shoot me, I said. He said, sit down there, sit down. He went to talk to somebody. At that time, I was only getting $50 a month from the Army. That's all the service was getting was $50 a month. He came to me and said, Grasso, are you willing to give up $50 of your pay, $30 of your pay every month? And the government will give your father 30 I said, that's $60 a month? He said, yes, you're right. That's what I did. So the government gave your father 30 and they took $30 yeah. of your pay? For my pay every month. So my pop only lasted three months, he died. Eh? My father was a good man. Did you pass while you were in the service while you were? Yeah. 
I wrote to my family not to say anything to my brother Jimmy was fighting in Africa and don't say anything to Jim that Pop passed away. I'll tell him when the time is right. The day the war ended, I wrote him a letter and told him Pop passed away. So we both came home. I never thought I'd be home, but I got home. Yeah. You were able to come home for a, a brief after you were to come home? I came home for his funeral. And where were you at? Where did you come from when you went home? Where were you at? Where I was stationed in Georgia. Augusta? Uh, uh, I, I was stationed in Georgia when my father passed away. Savannah, Georgia. Camp Stewart. It's now, it's now, it's now Fort Stewart. With artillery, with artillery school. Pardon? This is now in Fort Bliss. It's now Fort Bliss? Oklahoma. I didn't know that. I, I never kept in touch. So, you, when you, you were drafted, you weren't able to take the branch, the service you went into? No, they, 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 they put me, they gave me a test where I was supposed to go and I wound up in artillery. And now, I, I took artillery school and then they broke up the artillery, and we all wound up in the infantry. I went overseas as infantrymen. And uh, we got overseas before the Battle of the Bulge started. In Southford, I was in the 639th, took a tremendous beating, and they lost 20, I don't know, 21 or 26 men, and they needed artillery men. And we were, we were in a what would, you, what would you call it now? So they they come in and pick men, put bring the different outfits, okay. and we're over three hundred men. And they came in. They gave us a test for aircraft artillery. And they they had three three hundred of us in the school, and they had that camera. They showed pictures, spread of different planes. The Germans, the Japanese, the Italian, the British and American planes. And you had to, see they flashed it, you had to write down what it was. Mm -hmm. I was one of the 21 that passed the test. I wound, I wound up back in artillery. Yeah, that was the best thing that ever happened. I don't know if you know about artillery. Yeah, they're better in artillery than in infantry, right? That's right. Really in infantry cool. man, infantry man in battle. His life was worth only 15 minutes. Yeah. So did you have to go to boot camp for basic training? I went to, it wasn't a boot camp, I went to basic training in Camp Stewart, Georgia. And I was out telling them that they shipped us over to South Carolina, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I wound up in the infantry. Thank God I got out of it. <laughs> soldier and not cracked up to be what you think it is, you know, especially the infantry. So, from Fort Stewart? Fort Stewart, Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson, and there you were trained? Infantry. Infantry. And then I went overseas. And then you went to, to Germany. I went to, no, I, I went to, I went to court course on the Queen Mary and the Queen Mary had no escort but it was faster than all the ships and that's scary no escort and uh, nine days I, I was puking my guts up excuse me 
we went, I went overseas in January. God, it was rough. That ship was going down and the waves go, going over the stack. And the, about the fifth or sixth day, we had the, the alarm goes off and you run to your post where you, got, where you have to go under. On the, the, on the ship, the little boat, what do they call them? That on the, on the side of the ship. Yeah, yeah. Everybody had to go to their, their spot so they let them down to the, you know, take them to the task. Mm -hmm. About the fifth day, the alarm went off. Oh, I said, I was, I was so sick. <coughs> I was in my cot. Everybody ran up the deck. I, I didn't go up, and the major come and picked me on my feet. Get up there, Groucho. Stop chasing us. As I hope he catches us and sinks us. I, was, I wanted to die. You, you don't know what his, I don't know if you ever got seasick. Well, when you heave your guts up all day long, you, it's no joke. <laughs> but how long was that trip? Nine days. Nine days. We landed in Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, the, the port, the ship couldn't go into port, too small. They had us out, out. We had to go off the side of the, side of the ship on the boat, coming down. And they brought us to shore. And they had the, the train waiting for us. And the, I, I don't know if you were. The Scottish, the Scottish Red Cross were giving us coffee and donuts. And the, I thought I was trying to be funny, because in the movies, when you hear these fellows talking, and they're going, my, this is a bloody hot day or something. You ever hear the, the British talk? Mm -hmm. So I go to the nurse, my God, this is a bloody hot day. Say, Don't say that, Yank. I said, why not? That's like you say F in America. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. Don't say that, Yank. <laughs> and from Scotland, I'm right across Scotland, right to England, right to, right, right up to, that is that port in England. I forget. I can't think of the port. Put us on a ship, right across, and that's where the, we went right to Normandy. I missed I missed that battle. So when I got there, I walked up the hill and I got into a German pillbox with two two big cannons. My God, I said, how did the men get through here? It was like shooting fish in a barrel. I missed that barrel. I talked to fellows that were there. The English Channel, do you believe the English Channel turned red with blood? All those men getting killed. And the, my, my three sons and my son, my grandson, when they went to Normandy, I told them, do me a favor. When you get there, just say a prayer for me. And they did. All those GIs, unbelievable. Not alive. Too many, too many. I, since the day the war ended, till this day, every night I say a prayer to God, please, no more wars. All these kids getting killed for nothing, for nothing. My, my oldest son, he served six years in Vietnam. But it, he, uh, he wanted to go into the army. I said, please, then you don't go into the army. You're a college graduate. Go to the Navy. In my own mind, I said, if you get killed, at least you'll die clean, not in a mud hole. But he had a good, he, got, he, did, he did good for six years. I have a, I have a, a niece that served 20 years in the Air Force. I have a nephew that graduated at West Point. I have nephews that were in every, almost every war. I, my, my family, I don't think there's another family in the United States that has a better record than we do. This, this, that, like, this is me talking. We fought all the wars, my whole family, and we did a good job. I gave you the order. I had the phone, I had my right ear, and I said, give me the order. Put the phone in my hand there. 
And we talked and we talked again. And then he escaped. The following day, I went down to the VA and I told him, you got to help me with the VA. He said, but you had to be on in 16 years. He said, so what? I just found out I'm deaf. He said, I couldn't get no help. I was living there. And I seemed to heck with it. Ten years later, I'm in a coffee shop in New York. And two fellows in front of me are talking. And one fellow goes to the other, I just got my retroactive pay for the loss of his hearing and new hearing aids. So I will go to but I hear you right. And I told him about my story. And you go down and see things have changed. I'm not lying to you, I swear to God. The next day I go down to the VA and I throw my discharge papers on the desk and I told the fellow, I'm deaf. I think that the VA should give me hearing aids. Oh, he says, go upstairs, get examined. Things have changed. I went up to get examined by the doctor. He says, you're completely deaf in this ear. This ear is almost gone. He wrote everything down. He says, if it's up to me, you get whatever coming to you. I said, oh, thanks, doc. Four days later, I get out, I swear to God, I get a letter from the VA. I owe them $106.06 for the doctor's visit. I called him up, I said, you're charging me? I'm a veteran and I'm a senior citizen. I Medicare don't charge me. They charge Medicare. The government can't charge the government. So I told him, well, what am I going to do? I paid the 106 dollars. Now I'm mad as hell. I'm really mad. And I had a beautiful doctor. She was a woman doctor. We had her for 30 years. And I'm all telling her, I'm mad. And I'm telling her, she said, you want some medicine, Joe? You're too damn calm. I have a fellow who's your age, he's a World War II veteran. He goes down to the VA, he fights as he gets it. I said to my wife, I'm going down tomorrow and I'm going to hop. He said, Joe, you're going to get locked up. I'm not lying to you, but the VA hospital in New York is different than here. It's a crowd with these GIs. It's wide open. Now I'm hollering, I'm screaming, and I'm cursing a little bit. I said, what the hell is it? Because I'm Italian and white. I can't get no help here. He said, don't say that. You get locked up. I said, I just said it. Lock me up. And I told him about my story of my whole family, that what we, what we did for this country. He said, sit down here. I'll be right back. He went upstairs. I come, he comes down. I got my hearing aid. Cost $500 a month. I have to fight what belongs to me. I got it. I mean, I'm not the VA here in Jersey, Connecticut, so much better. They treat me, they treat me so good here. I get my batteries, my hearing aids, my medicine, my glasses, my, my scooter I got from them, my wheelchair I got from them. I can't, you know, I, they treat me right. I, I can't complain about the, the VA in Connecticut. I really mean it. And I get help from here. Go ahead. I want to read this Man of the Normandy and this, this star. And this. I, went, I went up to the pillboxes and I looked down. And where did you guys, where did you go from Normandy? From Normandy, they put us on a train and I went right to the Battle of the Bulge. Right into the Battle of the Bulge? Right into the Battle of the Bulge. Was, was it an ongoing at that time or did you get there and it started up? No, no, it was, it was ongoing. It just started. And my God, we were, we were in the train and the shells were coming all over the place. <laughs> How many were there with you? Pardon? How many were there with you? How many soldiers went to, with you on that train? On that train, there had to be over 300 men. Was it all like one unit? Considered as units? No, no, it wasn't. We, we, we were replacements. Replacements for all different units. Right? Yeah, we were replacements. And... That's how I got back into the artillery. I went over, I went in infantry. And this outfit that I was with got hit bad and they needed 21 cannoneers. And that's how I passed and back into artillery. So in the Battle of the Bulge, you were artillery. In the yeah. Battle of the Train, you were yeah. with artillery units. And what were your experiences? I, 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 the, the town I was in was. Who could. Who could. 
town called Buchendorf, a town in Belgium. Not, not too far away from the 125th Infantry that was in Bastogne. And the Germans had to surround the tank. Oh, God. You don't know what that's like. You shoot an artillery out 40 millimeter shells and bouncing off the tank. <laughs> yeah. I said, we've had it. We're all going to get killed here. But it just, they, I mean, something changed. God watches everything. I, my mother and father and Jesus took care of me all my life. I came through that. So now of all of this, did it, did it end it for you or did you leave? No, we, we fought, I fought there about close to a week. And we pushed the Germans back. And then we kept pushing, pushing. And we got to the Rhine. That was that was another five days of battling. When we got to the Rhine, the Dusseldorf Bridge, the American planes were bought, trying to bomb it when the Germans had it. Pardon? At Remagen. Okay. That's the town, Remagen. Okay. And the Dusseldorf Bridge. And what happened was a Russian shell. You know, they were trying to blow the bridge up. I don't know if you know, they were trying to blow right. the bridge yeah. up. I didn't hear that. The Germans were trying to blow it up when we got there. Mm -hmm. What happened? A Russian shell hit their cable and they were trying to blow up. Oh, yeah. That, and the bridge was up. That's how we got across. But then the engineers built two pontoon bridges, one on each side of the bridge. And we got all, the whole army across. All the armies got across from there and then spread out with the Germans. That was the end of the war. That was really the end of the war. Now, between those two battles, did, did you, in your artillery unit, did you lose soldiers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got hit. We lost quite, not too many, but we lost men. A, a, a 40 millimeter cannon has 15 men. Eight men on a cannon and eight men on the M61. Now the M61 is four 50 caliber machine guns. So the system follows the planes around. He's a block away from us, protecting our back. So the German planes don't come down hitting us. We were lucky. I, I, I say I've been a lucky fellow all my life. Yeah. So Remagen is, is Remagen, across the river. They moved the whole army across the river. Right across the river. And are you traveling with, with them? Yeah, we, they yeah we kept on going forward. We got 50 miles from Berlin. And we weren't moving anymore. And I said to Captain, what's going on? We're not supposed to take Berlin. Then let the Russians take Berlin. Fine, let them take it. Who cares? Who, well, we're not fighting. And that, 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 that was the end of it. The Germans kept coming to us to, to surrender. You had a lot of them. Oh, yeah. I talked, I'm not lying, I must have talked to over 2,000 German soldiers. And, and, Ish Nazi? That one guy was a Nazi. <laughs> I said to the captain, who the heck are you fighting here? He said, they're all full of baloney. So where did you, what happened from there for you? What happened after that? No, then when, when we got, when the war ended, we had a lot of combat time. We were the first ones to come back to France. We come back to France, and we're on the road with all our cannons and half track. French girls came over to me. Hiya, Joe. You know my name. I just got here. <laughs> G.I. Joe. Yeah. What, what kind of time frames passed from when you first got to Valdebol's train ride from France? Say that again? Your train ride from France with the Battle of the Bulge, when you entered that battle, to the war. Yeah, we went to How much Mar time was that? I mean, you were fighting Finnish the whole time, right? Yeah. Close, 
I, how, long was, how long were you fighting? I came out of the end for that. I did all I know we just kept fighting, pushing the Germans, and then the war ended. And you guys had fought long enough that you were fighting, or did you be able to go back to France? No, when the war ended, we were, we were in Germany about a little over a month. We came back to France, and that is, I don't know if you know, uh, what the heck is that town in France? No, no. It's not a coast. Marseille, Marseille. Okay, yeah. And now, the war had ended, and they didn't know what to do with us. So they made us MPs. <laughs> we. We were in peace for about three or four months. We didn't arrest one guy. They, they, they threw us out. How could you, how could you arrest another GI? Are you kidding? They needed a, they needed a what did they need MPs for? They needed MPs. Convoy. Yeah, and uh, but now Marseille was a big seaport, and the soldiers that didn't have enough time, and from there they went to the Pacific. And that's what was going on. And a lot of a lot of soldiers that didn't have enough time, he put them on the ships and they went to the Pacific. And the war ended when I was in Marseille. The, the, the Jacks gave up. Japanese, excuse me. So, just a couple of questions on while you were there. What was the food like? What were you eating? What was I eating? Hay ration, tea ration, and ten and one. The box was ten men to a box. It wasn't bad. It's better than the food we get here. <laughs> Don't let that get out. But that's the truth. The food here is horrible. Absolutely horrible. They got they got a lot to cook here. They they burn water. Did you have a, a, did you have like a momento that you set? You know, some people kept rabbits or, or, or clocks. Or, how did you deal with all the stress? About stress? Mm -hmm. I, I did okay. I, I mean, I was happy the war was ended and coming home, my wife was waiting for me. She waited me for two years. When I was going overseas, she wanted to get married. I told her no. I didn't think I was coming back. And I always teased her. All these years we were married. Sure, you waited for me. You couldn't find nobody better. She was over 40 and said, You have no idea how many guys they asked me out. And I believe her, too. She was a beautiful woman. Did you, uh, after the battles ended and you had a little bit of less stressful time, did you, did you have any UFO shows or anything? Oh, yeah. Country? I saw a couple of shows with Bob Hope. He put on some shows, yeah, he did. And I, I went to a lot of show houses there in France. So we had, after the war ended, I, I had a good time. I, I, Any time there was a pass to go to, like I went to Paris three times, and then my first sergeant would go home, the other one, my friends would be some sergeant, and then they would. They had ski school up at St. Alps. I put my hand up and I, I went to ski school. The ski was, I went a month. I had a ball after the war. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. I really had a ball. And uh, I, w I went to Lord's France, the St. Benedict. And I, I'm, I'm a Catholic and I, I went to all those places. And uh, I, I, I think I had a really good time when I went home. So, you left, you got out of the service from Europe? You came, you came back here and... I went to Fort Dix, back. Fort Dix, New York, in New Jersey, and I came home. From Europe, you went to Fort Dix and El Paso? Yeah. When, uh, when I was in Fort Dix, the major you know, we were going through, and then when he came to me, he was 
God goes, why don't you sign up National Guard? I said, for what? Well, you have to, if you have to close your back, you don't want to start all over again. What, to be corporal? I said, so don't, I'm not lying to you. Are those like these chart papers there? He says, yeah, you're ready to be on Can I hold them? Yeah. I picked them up and I said to him, F the army, I want to go home. <laughs> Through my French. I'm telling you like it is. What did you, uh, what did you think of your officers and your, your fellow citizens? I had, I had one of the beautiful captains and two lieutenants that anybody would want to have. They, they always were up there with us. They never did. So I knew them this. They were right up, right up there with us all the time. All the time. My Captain Schaefer was a good guy. And then every time somebody got hit or killed, he'd, he'd go and by himself cry, by himself. And my two lieutenants, they were great. I got along great with them. So you remember the day that you, uh, you headed home from Fort Meade? Oh yeah, I remember that. I, I got on a train and I went on a train right to, to the Pennsylvania Station, New York, and I took the subway home. I, I knew I still had to travel on the subway. And I didn't tell my wife I was coming home. I just saw it was I was writing letters, I'm coming home soon. I knew when but I didn't tell her. And I came home in my duffel bag. Nobody recognized me. I went right to the house and I knocked up because I had no place to go because my father had passed away. So I went right to my wife's house, her mother's house, and I knocked on the door. I knew she was going to open the door. And she went, like, Joe! She jumped on me, you know, knocked me down. <laughs> yeah? She gave me two beautiful boys, I gotta say that. I, I said to her, Children, if you have any boys, please don't name none of me after me. Please don't do that. And the first one was born, she named after my father. The second one, she named Robert. When I went the third time, the doctor said, it's another boy, Mr. Grosso. I said, no. You know why? I went, no, he's mine. I'll take him. And I went into her room. She's in the bed. I said, what did you name him, babe? She named me right away. I said, she didn't. She said, I had a name in Joe. He was born in St. Joseph, so he's my youngest son. He's the doctor. Yeah. What, do you remember the days and weeks afterwards? What, what did you, you just go back into your normal routine? You go back to work at the town? I went right back to work where I was working. I, I, I stayed out two weeks. My mother will took me out for a trip, you know, and we went to Lake George. And I came back and went back to work. Not back into the foundry. I opened up my own big foundry. Oh, okay. I, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm not proud of what I'm going to tell you. I was a baby of 12. And my mother passed away, I was two. And my father brought us up. I never went to school. I regret it to this day. Really, you have no idea. So I knew the woman I know, she was, she was a teacher. Her husband was a professor, French professor. My two boys, I watched them like a hawk to make sure they went to school. I played hooky all the time. Nobody watching me. I regret that to this day that I never went to school. But I opened up a big business. Without an education, I did, I did great. I met my partner, may he rest in peace, and that, that started me off. I opened up a shop with 55 men, two girls in the office, and my two oldest sons working with me. I didn't want them to work with me in the family. I sent them to college a few of them. I get a call one day when I had the small shop, my middle son, Bobby. Dad, I come at home, I'm going to work, he was married two years, he worked for Exxon Gas. I hate Exxon Gas. I hate him with a passion. He came home. I said, what happened, Bob? He said, don't lie what I'm going to tell you. 
Being Italian and Catholic, I couldn't get no way here. Imagine, these folks, folks come away after me as a college graduate, as a mechanical engineer, and they were passing by, they were passing them by. And I'm going to come to work for you. Oh, come on, Bob, I don't want you in the foundry. You haven't been to the college to work with me in the foundry? He said, I'm going to want you to do that. Now, I said I had a small shop where he worked with me. But we did great. He was a mechanical engineer. I wasn't. I can't read the blueprints. He could read the blueprints. And we did great. We did great. We had that foundry. Like my partner's name was Joe. And I said to him, I met, I met him through an accident. He had sold it. I was a foreman in Jersey when the war ended. And uh, my old boss was opening up a foundry he bought in Hackensack. So I called up my wife. I said, don't wait for you to come eat tonight. I'll be home late. And I drove from Newark across the Jersey Time Park right to the Hackensack. And I'm looking for the, the Hackensack branch foundry, and I found it. And I walked in, and my ex boss says, Joe, what are you doing here? Uh, his name was Tom Bruno. He says, Tom, I heard you bought a foundry, and you're looking for partners. Are you interested? What do you think I'm doing here? I said, yes, I'm interested. And he took me in the office. It was a Friday, and uh, he says, we own this foundry, my two sons and my son-in-law, we got B stocks, A stocks. The fellow here works in the office, he's got B stocks. If you come in, you got C stocks. I know I'm not interested. If I got C stocks, I'm the last man on the totem pole to make any money. And I didn't care. So I said to Tom, if I come here to work, if I'm running my department, I'm a core maker in the foundry. A core maker in the foundry, I make all the things that are seen. Let's give you a good example of uh, the faucet where the water runs. I make everything that's hollow. And that's my job in the foundry. And we call it bronze or whatever. And who who walks in my partner, he wasn't my partner yet, he sold him the foundry. He says, this is Joe Engineering. Oh my gosh, I've been trying to meet you for years. What's your name? He says, Joe Grosso. I've been trying to meet you too. Where do you live? Brooklyn, where? Ten blocks from me. Yeah. He was, he was pretty rich. Can I tell you about it? Oh, sure. Hey, and... He didn't need a foundry. He wanted some place to flop to waste time. He was, he was 20 years older than me. And uh, he says, pick me up in the morning to take the work and I came. And I, I'm going through the Highland Tunnel. And I said to him, Joe, how come you didn't go partners with me? So I was selling the foundry. I had asked him. Just him and me. I don't want his sons or nobody else. Just him and me as partners. So I said, well, I'm coming in here, but there's something wrong. I can't put my finger on it. He says, why don't you go see a lawyer? I said, what am I going to tell the lawyer? I don't know what to tell the lawyer. Anyway, I quit my job to go to work there. And I had told him, don't have me come here on a Saturday just to see my face. If there's work in my department, I'll come in. Oh, that's okay, Joe, that's okay. And I worked with him for about not quite a month. I had to put up $5,000. I didn't put it up yet. And uh, I made the course for a big job. His son made it to campus. It was a little bigger than this here, but a big room in Cassidy. And I made the course for that. His son made the mold and put the course. I'm in my department. All of a sudden, I hear Tom Brown screaming like anything. I thought somebody got hurt. I ran outside. What happened? He forgot to put a call in there. Oh, not like that. It took him all day to make that job, and it's no good. So I looked at the cash register. This was Friday. I looked at the cash register. I looked at the cash I says, Tom, I'll save that cash register. You're going to save it? Yeah. 
I'll come in tomorrow, Saturday, at my own time. Give me a good grindstone, hammer and chisel and file. I'll fix it. And I did. Come in Monday. He says, come on, Joe, I'll take you out for lunch. Tom, I don't want you to take me out for lunch. I'm going to be a partner here. We had to make money. And his son was there. And the front, you were supposed to make two of these nails, not one. And his father goes, yeah, you only made one. To show him that I know what I'm talking about, you know. He said, we're here to make money. That's what I'm here for. So, he let that go. Following week, comes Friday. I don't come in Saturday, because there's, there's nothing in my department to be hired. So I didn't come in. Next, next week I get my check. A couple of days pay. Well, what are you doing, Tom? Huh? You didn't come in Saturday. As I told you, I don't come in on Saturday just to see my face. If there's work, I'll come in. And you want to pay me today. I quit as I quit. No, Joe, I don't want you to get me. Just laid the foundation. I said, I took my tools, I threw my toolbox. I know it wasn't my partner yet, Joe. I said, Joe, I'm going home. I quit. Wait, take me home. Now we're going for the tunnel. What happened? So I told him what happened. So I told him to go see a lawyer. I said, what the heck am I going to tell the lawyer? So the following month, I got three children I need to work. So I went back to my old job with two Jewish fellows over. One was the old timer and the other was a young fellow. And I attempted to speak to the office. Joe, you're back? I need a job. I got three children. I need to work. But they're not the foreman. Can I ask you for a foreman's job? I want a mechanic's job. And he tried to shame me the only way he could. At that time, he was kind of like, $2.50 an hour. So I start you off at $2.40. Just to shame me, because I left. So I said, okay, I'll take it. I'm going down. Who works with the old Jewish fellow? And so you're back. Morris, I'm back for you, not for him. I told him what happened. He started arguing. He talked to him like this. So you're back. You're the foreman. <laughs> That's how I got started again. Yeah. So let me ask you, did you, did you uh, have any, maintain any relationships with any of your own buddies after you got out? Oh, yeah. We used to meet. The office used to meet. One fellow was a sergeant, but he was in a different battery room. I was in B battery, he was in A battery. And he lived next town from me. I was in Little Brazil in Greenpoint. And I'd see him a lot. And we used to meet, the thugs used to meet once a year at 100, 46th Street and Park Avenue in Armory. And we used to meet there and have a dinner. All the fellows we used to meet, the captain and all the officers and all the companies. And it was great. How long was that going? It lasted four years. And it broke up. It lasted four years. No, I, I, when I came here in Connecticut, I was hoping someday I'd meet somebody that told me to came from my album in Connecticut. I didn't meet one fellow. I was left to meet a couple of them. Yeah, they're probably all gone. I'm pushing 94 myself. Quite a few veterans still left since I'm here. I don't know. I can't answer that. I, I was glad to get out. Glad the war ended. It's horrible. What can I say? My son went in six years in the Navy. Yeah, I had a good life. I can honestly say I've been lucky. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been lucky all my life. Jesus has been walking with me all my life. And my mother and father have been watching me. They're still watching me. I know they are. I couldn't have got this far without them. Well, I think we're about done. Is there anything you would like to add? Anything you haven't said that you would like to add? Not really. I had a good life. What can I say? I've been lucky. I met a beautiful woman. She gave me three beautiful boys. And They've taken care of me here. If 
proud, I'm proud of my good kid, Darini. I'm proud of him, especially my young one is a doctor. Yeah, I did, I did all right without an education. I think I did fine. Well, I want to thank you for your service and thank you for taking the time to let us talk to you and That's share okay. your story. I thank you for, for listening. Really, is not much. The battles, you know, the battles are battles.